and he, he does a little intro and then um, am I supposed to do the it's up to you I mean like my intro is like it's useless and you're like I don't everyone okay, you, you do it okay and let's get it <clears throat> let's get go I, I, I don't have to do it like I can just like you know copy and paste into the chat room so that I can stay okay all right behind the scene. and then I will I will um, no, no, I will no. introduce Jeff okay hmm? why, don't you, why don't you show your video why don't you show yourself I'm gonna get my oh, Oh yeah, I forgot the one asking like Jeff. Like, uh, I'm just curious. Would you like your session to be recorded? Uh, I I don't care if if that's what's good for your people. That's fine. I have no uh, opinions on this. All right, perfect. Thanks. Art just Palmer. Art Palmer raised his hand. Hello, Art. Hello. This is. Great, Jeff, you give us a one hour distraction today. Um, but I have to apologize in advance. I'll have to leave at five to noon because I have to run a faculty meeting. No worries, I'm sure I'll be done by then, so. Mm -hmm. All right, surprising. Would, you to, <clears throat> would you like to give one of these talks at some point in the not too distant future? It would be an honor, Bob, but I can't say anything about DNP. Well, you can say something about NMR. Other, other than the fact we go through a lot of nitrogen, <laughs> structural <laughs> <biology>. <laughs> All I'll be in contact with you. OK, okay. of course. But you know, I can only talk about relaxation. I know nothing else about NMR. Well, that's not a bad topic. It's perfectly acceptable, interesting topic, and yeah. it is. Jeff, how are how's the air quality? Um, well, the smoke the smoke has dissipated from the recent fires um, mostly, although there's still some orange sunsets that come that come from that. So we're we're doing better, although uh, a lot of these fires are still smoldering, and this coming weekend we're expecting or hoping for a first sort of mild winter storm that hopefully will at least the Northern California fires will extinguish. Southern California is still in a bad way. So very challenging. I have a brother and a nephew in San Francisco who have just been sending horrific photographs. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got my share of uh, shocking pictures uh, that you would not believe. But uh, uh, so the air quality is, is orange, not uh, in the it's green, orange, red. We're in the orange category. Uh, but for, uh, I think, two or three weeks in a row, we were in the red category. And it was it was really bad. Uh, apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. Orange skies, you know, ash falling on, on the ground. Uh, you need an N95 to go outside. I uh, just that 74 people could, could feel like they want to waste an hour. But uh, it's uh... okay. Well, another couple of minutes. We so MIT time is ten oh five to or eleven oh five. That's when we start. So um, slightly after the um, um, turn of turn of the hour. Yeah, yeah. Today is a university holiday for Columbia, so that everybody can vote. Bless them. And That's a good yesterday, idea. Yesterday. Yesterday was not a holiday, but there were no classes held so that in normal years, students had time to travel home to vote, although this year nobody traveled. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's appalling that it's just not a national holiday. It is appalling. You're right. Yeah. But in the, in the long list of things that are appalling about how we run elections, I suppose that's not the worst. Indeed. Yeah. Well, they, they could make it an election on Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. That would be an easy thing to do, too. Businesses probably would like that better. Yeah. Well, my polling place this morning, a woman showed up. And when she saw the line complained, she couldn't waste an hour to stand in line and vote. So she left in a huff. And 
the Hispanic guy behind me says, people die around the world for the right to vote and she can't stand in line for an hour? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kong, you want to get started? Okay. No, it's okay. I mean, like, I already, like, copy and paste it in the chat room. So everyone, like, yeah, yeah. it's okay. You can, you can start. I'll shut my... No, no, no. Okay, so our speaker today is Jeff Reimer, um, and he is from the University of California uh, <clears throat> at Berserkly, as it's affectionately known, uh, Berkeley, California. And Jeff did his undergraduate work uh, where at UC Santa Cruz, was that right, or somewhere? Right? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, okay. Uh, and then he did his PhD at Caltech, uh, <clears throat> and it started out with uh, with a very famous solid state in a Mars spectroscopist, Robert Vaughn, uh, who unfortunately died in a, in a plane wreck, uh, plane crash in 1979. Uh, but after that, uh, Jeff finished up and moved to Berkeley, uh, where he's been on the chemical engineering faculty forever, uh, doing really nice science. And today he's going to tell us about uh, some of that, some materials uh, oriented experiments that he's been working on for some time now. So Jeff, the virtual floor is yours, okay? Thank you very much, Bob. Thanks uh, to you and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, and Kong and the MIT team for uh, hosting this uh, lovely time. Let me just get this thing running here. Bingo, there we are. Uh, greetings to all of you from uh, California and uh, on, this, on this day when the future of my country hangs in the balance. So it's quite a, a powerful day for me, uh, but always a pleasure to be able to come uh, to the NMR community. I put up Bob's uh, website for the Zoominar here because uh, like perhaps I shouldn't have, I was not thinking about the content of this lecture uh, until uh, closer to the uh, delivery date. And I discovered down here at the bottom, uh, this little uh, comment here that uh, I'm to be talking about the latest research finding no older than one year of published material. And so this uh, is an interesting challenge. First of all, it assumes you're publishing more than one paper a year, which fortunately my group uh, manages to make. Uh, but it also is complicated for me because in November, uh, before the apocalypse, I actually had the pleasure of visiting MIT and giving a lecture there. So uh, not only am I looking at new material, but a material that Bob hasn't heard before. So I, I'm uh, pleased to be able to talk about uh, NMR uh, and adsorption on surfaces. And I use the word blunt NMR, courtesy of my colleague, Alex Pines, uh, who points out that uh, Reimer's work uh, is often unimaginative from the point of view of magnetic resonance, but imaginative from the point of view of application. And uh, from Alex, I take that as a very kind compliment. So uh, I do uh, uh, want to share with you then content that's perhaps more materials oriented than you're uh, normally used to. Uh, and these four papers in particular have been published according to Bob's rules. And uh, they're the ones I want to talk to you about. And they are largely about adsorption on surfaces. And it's really the work of my former postdoc, Alex Force, who's now a professor of chemistry at Cambridge, uh, and a visiting scholar in my group, uh, Haiyan Mao, who's uh, visiting uh, my lab for uh, the last year or two. <clears throat> now, uh, it's uh, important for me to sort of set the stage a little bit. I can't really just jump into the technical details of these papers without sort of providing you a little bit of backdrop. So the first few slides are, are review material, but hopefully uh, won't uh, distract you too much. You're all certainly aware of the challenge. This is the amount of work, ideal work, necessary to separate CO2 from nitrogen. And this is the mole fraction of nitrogen uh, in that gas mixture. And you recognize then that for every source of CO2 into our atmosphere, coal combustion, natural gas combustion, incineration, cement, steel, all of them have a different concentration of CO2 in the exhaust gas. And the exhaust gas has varying conditions. Some of them are extremely hot, cement manufacturing exhaust gas, 200 degrees C. And some of them are, <clears throat> are fairly mild. So for example, a coal-fired power plant, the exhaust gas is about 40 degrees C. And so <clears throat> the nature of the exhaust system and the concentration determines how much work is needed to do it. And the most challenging of all, 
is, is getting CO2 directly from air. Uh, that takes a lot of work and is vexing, as I'll show you in a few minutes. The strategy or one strategy that um, my colleagues and I have been adopting is to imagine using white powder uh, that's imbibed with certain chemicals that bind CO2 selectively and let the nitrogen pass through. And we imagine these powders being placed on the exhaust stack of a coal-fired power plant. By the way, uh, this picture, which I shot in Germany, uh, these are the cooling towers and that's steam. This exhaust from the coal-fired power plant is here, just uh, FYI. So what is the chemistry that we plan to use inside of a metal organic framework to capture CO2? Well, CO2 being the weak acid that it is, you imagine a base like an amine, and if that amine is tethered to the MOF, then we have this reversible chemistry. In the gas mixture, CO2 adsorbs onto the uh, amines to form a carbamate. Uh, and then at a subsequent step, the carbamate system is heated up and then uh, we regenerate the amine and the CO2 comes off, which we can subsequently use for utilization, creating chemicals, for example, or storage as in sequestering underground. So it's this motif of carbamate chemistry that uh, uh, under, uh, pins the, the work we want to do. So in more detail, let's get to the specific work. So the past few years, uh, my work, my group has been working closely with Jeff Long in the chemistry department at Berkeley. And Jeff and his colleagues have been very popularly, very much popularizing the metal organic framework of the so-called MOF 74 family. Uh, I'll say more about it in a few minutes. But the reason this metal organic framework is fascinating is because it has these big wide open pores so that gases can readily diffuse in and out of the material. And yet the material has open Lewis acid sites, an under-coordinated metal site, so that molecules can be bound here with great specificity. And the molecules we're going to choose are diamines. And the reason we're choosing the diamines is that we're going to presume that one end of the diamine will bind to the open metal site, as shown in this cartoon, and then the other end dangles into the pore, ready to snatch a CO2 as it comes by to form a carbamate. So, uh, you know, very simple NMR methods have been insightful in just establishing the premise. So, for example, you can bind uh, these amines to the metals and you can look at N15 NMR and the chemical shift of nitrogen bound to the metal is distinct from that that's free in the pore. Uh, these spectra are simple to obtain. They're easily modeled with DFT and get quantitative agreement between calculation and theory. And if you're so in interested, you can look at exchange rates between bound and unbound. And for some diamines, those exchange rates are rapid at room temperature. And for others, such as the one I've shown in this, in this picture, uh, the exchange isn't happening. So uh, what have we been doing? So the idea is now you tune the nature of this material by choosing different diamines and ask the following question, does the carbomate chemistry happen like we expect that it does? It does, and it does so in a way that's really quite surprising. So if you imagine now the diamine with one end of the amine bound to the metal, the other free in the pore, as this cartoon shows here, what happens then is that when CO2 is introduced, the uh, acidic CO2 attacks the metal nitrogen bond, and the first one that does so weakens the subsequent other metal nitrogen bonds so that very rapidly and cooperatively you form ammonium carbamate chains. Um, we established this early on in a paper in Nature a few years ago, uh, but Alex Force, in sort of his uh, anchoring work uh, at Berkeley when he was in my lab, basically established a class of NMR methods that, that uh, show us what these mechanisms are. So it, with other diamines, Alex was able to show you form carbamic acid pairs as opposed to ammonium carbamate chains. Or with even other diamines, you actually form a, a mixture where one side of the tube might be carbamate and the other carbamic acid pairs. And all these were resolved uh, via um, NMR methods. And so I'll show you what that protocol was that Alex developed, and then we'll move on to new material. So here's an example of a very attractive uh, diamine, an asymmetric one like this. And now you see why it is so attractive from the point of view of uh, capturing CO2. Look at how rapidly the isotherm jumps with a small change of pressure. 
This step change is the signature of this cooperative mechanism where the first CO2 weakens subsequent react, uh, facilitates su subsequent reactions so that they go very quickly. It's, uh, it's a very exciting strategy because uh, small pressure changes to go on and off the material mean that the energy consumption to use it in an industrial process is greatly uh, lowered compared to uh, traditional uh, adsorption isotherms. So you can do carbon-13 NMR. Let's take C13CO2 and place it over the sample. And I'll show you, show you a little bit as to how we do that. Uh, you direct excitation, you can see the fizzysorb CO2 in the tubes. Uh, and you see the chemisorb that's bound, a nice single peak. And you can cross-polarize to isolate very nicely just the chemisorb CO2. The chemical shift of this peak suggests um, a carbamate or a carbamic acid. And so a uh, nitrogen-15 NMR is also deployed. So here before CO2 is added, you see the nice two peaks, the broader one because it's bound to the metal. Uh, and then as we add CO2, you form a, a nitrogen associated with a carbamate and the ammonium ion. So this seems pretty clear that it's ammonium carbamate, but uh, as Alex showed in all his studies, it's not enough. So the HETCOR experiment uh, turns out to be extremely powerful. So this uh, relatively straightforward two-dimensional method shows us Look down this axis here. Here's the single carbon-13 peak here, projected here. And on the proton shift axis, what you see is a strong correlation with a proton whose chemical shift is 4.3 ppm, consistent with the amine here, and uh, a weaker interaction with a proton whose chemical shift is 13.2 ppm, consistent with the ammonium ion. And of course, this peak is stronger than this one because the proton is closer to the carbon in this uh, moiety as opposed to this one. So the carbon-13 chemical shift, the nitrogen-15 chemical shift, the HET core measurements, and I haven't shown, but the proton chemical shifts all come together. They can be assembled with a DFT calculation and its ammonium carbamate chains is the mechanism for this particular one. So now having established this protocol, Alex, uh, uh, basically uh, taught an undergrad, Holly Redfern, how to do all of this, and dozens of uh, materials can be examined in this way. Um, I, before I close I, uh, on the introductory part, let me just remind you uh, in this really difficult time in the US history with regard to climate change, here's the adsorption isotherm for one of these diamines. And you see there's the characteristic step function, very attractive for carbon capture. This pressure scale may not be interesting to you, but if I told you that this is 400 ppm, then maybe you would uh, get excited because with a very small change in temperature, uh, carbon dioxide from the air can be captured and then desorb. And so this is a material that's ideal for car air, direct air capture. And uh, it's very exciting to be so close to the chemistry that has such uh, powerful potential for the future. But I just want to point you out, here's a cartoon. This is not real. This is a cartoon from a company that shows the scale at which we'd have to do direct air capture. So each one of these units is an adsorption unit and the desorb CO2 would be piped underground, for example, or used to a utilization plant. See this device? Uh, huge, isn't it? We would need tens of thousands of these units. Um, to make an impact on the amount of CO2 in the air if we were to use direct air capture with these technologies. So that's just a poignant reminder to us all that we would all have to work together and share policy and principle uh, to diminish the carbon in the atmosphere by direct air capture. Okay, so let's go to the new material now, the things published since October, because Bob has uh, directed us, we want to be contemporary. So uh, one of the things Alex uh, and we all discussed was, do we really just have to use diamines? So for example, let's take a look at this simple amine alcohol system and ask the following question. If I bind it to the open metal site in these frameworks, will it also do this cooperative mechanism and therefore introduce a whole other family of possible um, facilitants for this process? And sure enough, this particular uh, 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 alcohol amine, look at the adsorption isotherm. There's that nice step change. 
uh, it's preferential to CO2 as opposed to uh, the others. And so the question we want to ask is, is the mechanism the same? That is, do we form, for example, ammonium carbamate? And once again, Alex will turn to his toolkit. First of all, before uh, adding the CO2, look at the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of the adsorbed uh, capture agent. And we see that it has four peaks of, of equal area. Uh, and so it's consistent with this structure being bound. The nitrogen-15 NMR of this moiety is a little ambiguous to us. 32 ppm is really not exactly what we expected. And so Alex sat down with his uh, in the cast up uh, software and examined, well, what's the difference in energy between binding at the oxygen versus binding at the nitrogen? And he discerned that, look, there's only a small energy difference. So these two are almost certainly fluctuating and that's consistent with this particular chemical shift. All right, let's add C13CO2 to this system. And let's, for example, just focus on the head core. So here we have uh, the carbon 13 chemical shift but it's different than it was, a few ppm for the ammonium carbamate. And if we project along the proton axis, we see a very unusual shift of about 11 and a half ppm, not consistent with the ones we had previously. And we surmise that that's consistent with the carboxylic acid group, as is this shift. And in this particular case, the cooperative absorption mechanism occurs, via, but it's via carbamic acid chains uh, that line along the inside of the tube. So uh, again, we're, we've established that a whole nother class of molecules can do the carbon capture. Uh, they have a cooperative mechanism. Uh, and, and in this case, they produce carbamic acid chains. So what's the problem? Well, you'd think, well, now that we have tunable diamines, we could just uh, go to industry and sell them, uh, well, not sell them, but as you, you know, deliver to them this technology and they would uh, launch it. Well, there's a problem. And this cartoon shows exactly what the problem is. Here's a cartoon of a diamine bound to a, a magnesium metal moth. Now, if you expose that to wet steam at 40 degrees C, regrettably, after cycles, what happens is uh, the water or the steam attack the uh, metal nitrogen bond. Uh, CO2 binds uh, strongly to the open metal site. You volatilize the amine, and after a period of time, the amines are all blown out of the system, and you're no longer doing carbon capture. So stability and cyclability are a problem with this system. So the chemists in Jeff's group had this very grand epiphany and that is suppose I tether two ends uh, of this system down to the metal and have another two nitrogens uh, in the pore, uh, call it a tetraamine, uh, two ends downed. And the idea being that this would be more stable and we would have to get the size correct so that the two uh, binding amines roughly match the metal spacing inside the lattice. And if we did that, then perhaps we would have the stability necessary uh, to actually use these kinds of materials for carbon capture. Well, here's the adsorption. Here's one of our favorite uh, tetraamines. You notice it's symmetric. Here's the adsorption isotherm. Here's those step changes. That's lovely. Regrettably or fascinatingly, there's actually two steps of roughly equal size. And we'll have to figure out what that means in the context of uh, the mechanism. But this particular mean is interesting because you'll notice that natural gas flue gas, that is uh, a natural gas fired power plant, delivers CO2 at about 40 millibar. Uh, and if you look at 90 degrees C, that's uh, easily accessible in the exhaust temperature. And just jumping the temperature up to 120 degrees C would completely desorb this material. Uh, and, and get us down to a very low pressure of CO2. That is to say this particular tetraamine and the adsorption isotherm portend uh, excellent capture for the natural gas fired power plant. Alas, we don't quite understand what two steps mean. So uh, let's begin and look at structural studies. So here's our cartoon. Here's our favorite uh, magnesium uh, MOF 274. There's the, uh, the linker here. You can see it here. It's actually two aromat aromatic rings uh, with carboxylic acid groups that uh, form this. And uh, let's go and take a look at the structure. Problem, we can't grow large single crystals of the main com uh, magnesium compound. Uh, that's regrettable. Uh, it's an aspect of the chemistry of metal organic frameworks, their growth, it's not completely clear. But you can grow the zinc analog, and we get nice big crystals of the zinc analog, and then can do single crystal x-ray studies. 
And what you see is this very attractive structure in which, look, here's the metal nitrogen bond here, just like we have in the cartoon. And at the other end is the other metal nitrogen bond here. And look at these other two amines stabilized by hydrogen bonds to their neighbors, uh, and they span the pore space. So uh, at least for the zinc analog, it looks like um, we've constructed what we had hoped to construct. All right, let's go back to the magnesium now. And the power here of NMR is that it doesn't particularly care whether it's a big crystal or not, it can be powder. And so let's start by looking at this particular tetraamine. And here's the carbon 13 of the tetraamine here. And it's four peaks, uh, and which means that this bound product, CO2 on this is a symmetric product. Let's take a look at the N15 MAS NMR. Here's the precursor material before we introduce CO2, the secondary and primary amine. Uh, the introduction of CO2 leads to ammonium carbamate. A pause. I know you're angry at me already. You can't surely think that this is good enough signal and noise to uniquely identify ammonium carbamate. Okay, friends. I agree the signal and noise is not so great in this natural abundance N15 spectrum. But you have to realize that behind this now we have dozens, maybe a hundred, uh, ammonium carbamate spectrum from a whole variety of different moths. And so we have pretty high confidence that this is an acceptable uh, uh, assignment of the N15 spectra, that the product would be ammonium carbamate. But of course, uh, let's go back to the carbon-13 NMR of the chemisorb CO2. And now we can do the head core measurement. Uh, and here we see data that are almost identical to what we've seen with the diamine systems. That is the uh, correlation between the carbon and a proton shift of the ammonium ion and the carbon and the proton shift to the amine group. So we have uh, ammonium carbamate chains in this particular material. So uh, a new class of materials. Uh, so why are there two adsorption bumps? So here's where DFT uh, and the partnership between DFT and NMR come in handy, especially with materials that are uh, regular periodic arrays. So now that we have spectroscopy, we can tune and uh, optimize the DFT calculations to be consistent uh, with structure and uh, nitrogen, carbon, and proton shifts. And when you do that then, and look what happens when you add CO2. Uh, so here's our um, tetraamine spanning the pore. And the first molecule of CO2 reacts with one metal nitrogen bond. That's the first adsorption isotherm step, cooperative along the walls. And then the second step occurs on the other side of the walls. And the energy of this step is slightly different because the other end has already been reacted. And so this explains very nicely the two steps that are associated with um, this tetraamine. And then here's the coup de gras. Look, here's uh, the number of cycles in which we've introduced CO2 wet and uh, dried CO2 wet between these two temperatures. And look at this cycling stability. So we have the natural gas fired power plant capture material uh, ideally optimized uh, in this system. Very exciting for us. So um, now let's uh, move on uh, now and ask the question, well, what about things other than CO2? Gas separations are important for a lot of uh, industrial processes. And many of those separations involve very expensive in terms of energy consumption processes. And adsorption would be a nice one to continue to use the problem is if you want to separate nitrogen, not CO2, but nitrogen from a gas stream, nitrogen is particularly problematic uh, because of course it has no dipole moment. It's a, it's a very tricky gas to capture. But look, here we have a moth that shows what looks like a very nice cooperative adsorption isotherm. Big step change with a introduction of nitrogen gas. Uh, as compared to the Langmuirian process that you would see with uh, gases like methane, for example. So we're very excited about this material as a separation agent for nitrogen from other things. Uh, and uh, the question is, what is the material and how does it work? Well, this particular metal organic framework is a vanadium one. So the, the exposed sites are vanadium two. Um, and uh, you can see this cartoon here that shows the vanadium chlorine and vanadium nitrogen bonds that make up this material. And uh, the interesting thing is that the linker, because it binds through the nitrogen, unlike a carboxylic acid, which binds through the oxygen, the nitrogen vanadium linker uh, is, uh, uh, allows for very different kinds of chemistry to occur here with the vanadium, including backbonding or presumably backbonding from gases such as nitrogen. 
Uh, to show you how attractive this material is, here's a reproduction of that absorption isotherm. And then here's the isosteric heat of absorption for nitrogen on this system. And this range is just about ideal for temperature swing absorption desorption uh, for, uh, for industrial processes. So this truly is an attractive material. Now ask yourself the following question. You can sit down with your group and ask, well, how do you ascertain how nitrogen binds to this material? Uh, and one of the answers is N15 NMR. And Alex uh, Force, my postdoc, managed to engage a very clever undergraduate named Mark Cunningham uh, to just begin doing N15 gas phase NMR. And uh, you would think that that would be a foolish thing to try, but it turns out it's relatively straightforward. And so here's an example at about 700 millibar, that is seven tenths of an atmosphere, if you like, of nitrogen. Uh, and here's its chemical shift of nitrogen gas, very clever. And now let's add two, let's add the metal organic framework here. And now you see uh, what's exciting and revealing to us. First of all, the chemical shift of this nitrogen moves in a direction that's consistent with paramagnetic effects, as does the line width change. Uh, and so uh, what we have then is uh, the paramagnetic effect uh, of the nitrogen shift, and that's consistent with this DFT optimized structure as shown here. And there's the nitrogen sitting on top of the uh, vanadium. And uh, we are excited about this because this material has a record capacity for nitrogen absorption, uh, a record selectivity for nitrogen against methane. Uh, it's easily regenerated as the isosteric heats of absorption told you and the backbonding capability can be leveraged. So anything with a double bond can presumably backbond to this. And so this suggests olefin and paraffin separations. So, uh, you know, blunt NMR, simple MAS nitrogen 15. Uh, you could not imagine a more straightforward measurement uh, and yet it was able to help us with this mechanism. So that's these three papers here that have appeared since October uh, of 2019. Uh, and this is the guy responsible for much of this work. Uh, he's now an assistant professor, Alex Force at Cambridge. Here's Mark Cunningham, the undergrad who uh, did the nitrogen 15 gas phase measurements on this system and many others. He's now a grad student in, uh, in Munich. And of course, my colleagues, Jeff Long and Jeff Neaton, uh, who, as you can see, are co-authors on these papers, Jeff, the synthetic chemist, inorganic chemist, and Jeff Neaton. Um, the uh, computational person. So three Jeffs on a paper, uh, it's uh, it was a little bit confusing for some. All right then, so uh, one last topic then before we call it a day, uh, which is metal organic frameworks are these elegant and these beautiful systems. The blunt NMR reveals a lot about the mechanism by which we can capture gases like nitrogen or CO2. But many people are critical of metal organic frameworks as deployable on the scale of hundreds of tons or thousands of tons uh, of uh, material uh, to significantly affect industrial or direct air capture. So what happens if we imagine a blunt sourced adsorbent? That is an adsorbent material that was far less elegant, at least ostensibly less elegant than a metal organic framework. And as these two failed journal covers show, uh, we wish to do simple NMR uh, on what are ostensibly simple adsorbents. So where do they come from? Um, if you grew up in the United States of America, uh, as a child, you were probably exposed to scouting. And I'm hoping that people, some people in the audience will have fond memories uh, of when they were a child and the Pinewood Derby in which pine is used by children to make cars and they race them on tracks. It's um, a rite of passage in Americana. And um, the reason I mention it is because pine uh, is an uh, elegantly sustainable resource, uh, easily available. If you look worldwide, the distribution of pine in the Northern hemisphere alone suggests that as a source material, it's sustainable and easily, uh, easily grown. So uh, what are we going to do with pine? So we'll work with uh, Dr. Jing Tong, who's a, a postdoc with uh, Yi Kui's group at Stanford University. And Jing and her colleagues have been developing a protocol for taking pine wood, heating it up in the absence of oxygen to produce a char. That char has big pores in it. Imbibe the pores with potassium carbamate. Activate that carbonate to uh, conduct solid state chemistry in the char. 
Rinse it out and what you're left behind is a material that has both micropores and mesopores. And uh, here are, is the adsorption isotherm, for example, for this material with uh, nitrogen or perhaps argon. Uh, and you can see it has a, a quite high surface area, uh, some, some uh, condensable pores. And if you look at the pore size distribution, you recognize that there's mesopores, uh, there's large pores, there's mesopores, and there's even very small pores. And hence this material is called hierarchical nanoporous carbon. Let's take a look and ask, what can we do? Now we'll, uh, that's the blunt material, comes from pine. Uh, and now we'll do blunt NMR, we'll look at organics and CO2 adsorb in this system with the same uh, kinds of strategies that we did for MOFs. And Dr. Haiyan Mao, a visiting scholar in my lab, is going to conduct those measurements. Um, here, the, the amazing thing about this potassium carbamate treatment is that, look, uh, after you've generated the hierarchical nanoporous carbon, look, the cell structure of the wood actually still remains uh, on this macropore scale, which means like the metal organic frameworks, you have large channels for gases uh, and liquids to be able to move through them. But if you go from SEM to TEM, you're actually able to discern these mesopores, which are uh, on the order of nanometers as shown here. And so that's why we cartoon this material as HNC, hierarchical nanoporous carbon. And this cartoon shows that we have big pores connected to smaller pores. And um, uh, Jing and, and Haiyan and their colleagues were able to show that this uh, material satisfies a criterion known as Murray's law, which is uh, a way of categorizing the relationship between mesopores and micropores, namely that you have this sort of tree-like structure of pore inside the material. So there are simple things you can do. And uh, if there, any of you are on the call today who are associated with low field NMR instruments, uh, as I've told my colleague Bernard Blubank many times, you people need to get MAS going in these low field systems. And I'll tell you, this is one reason why. Uh, let's take the HNC material, dry it overnight, put it in a rotor and introduce a volatile organic carbon, so like acetone or hexane or something, and then run it over and do a, a proton, simple proton MAS. And what you're able to do is look at the amount on the surface as a, a function of the amount that's been introduced and compare, for example, uh, a, a commercial sorption analyzer, which takes a lot of time, to a single pulse proton NMR measurement. And while early on there's a lag between what the uh, commercial instrument measures and what NMR provides, uh, at the end you get a very accurate measurement of the adsorption capacity of these materials. And so um, the simplest blunt NMR, integrate the area under the curve, turns out to be useful uh, in characterizing uh, large quantities, uh, large numbers of samples, uh, something that uh, Magritech maybe should think about. Okay, so let's take a look at more detail. Let's do some blunt NMR. Hyann will take acetone. She will introduce it in this material. Here's the chemical shift of neat acetone, proton chemical shift. Uh, and as she introduces, she sees a, a peak. That's at a very unusual negative chemical shift. And then that peak appears to saturate. Uh, and then with further addition, she gets uh, the, uh, this peak. It's relatively straightforward to assign this to uh, X-pore and in-pore. And why is the chemical shift negative? This is a nucleus independent chemical shift deriving from the ring structure in the carbon material that you can calculate these chemical shifts. And this methodology was, uh, or has been most recently used uh, extensively by, by Claire and her group to look at carbons. Uh, and I think Alex Force was associated with that measurement when he was a PhD student. So these shifts are calculable and they're consistent with these structures. Uh, and you can also do simple exchange measurements and you recognize that these two will exchange with each other uh, on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. So uh, that works out fairly well. And so we have a nice cartoon that shows that we have in pore acetone, uh, expor acetone and exchange. And we can look at many different materials and let's compare for a moment uh, two liquids, toluene and hexane, and compare that to gas phase adsorption of those same materials. So again, here's a proton NMR spectrum of toluene and liquid hexane uh, uh, exposed as a liquid at very high loading. And we can compare that to gas phase toluene and gas phase hexane as a function of adsorption time. 
And what we are able to discern, much like the case we saw a minute ago with uh, acetone, is that you can see in-pore, micropores with large negative shifts because of the proximity of the um, carbon rings, uh, mesopores in which the ring shifts are smaller, and then expore in which you look very similar to liquid. And all these, she uh, uh, these peaks are consistent, at least at saturation, with the liquid ones. So far, so good. Here was the puzzle, a puzzle which we don't yet understand. Let's take a liquid acetone. I showed you these data previously. There's liquid acetone outside the pores and there's some inside the pore. There's a little bit condensed on the side of the tube, regrettably, uh, that confuses the situation. But let's take gas phase adsorption of acetone in this system. Add for one minute, six minutes, and so forth, three hours. And you see that uh, indeed an in-pour peak grows, uh, and, but we never get uh, the kind of peak that we do here. And so you're probably saying, well, that's because you just didn't wait long enough. That is, uh, if you'd waited longer, this peak would uh, move over here or this peak would move over here. Well, let's test that. Let's take this particular sample. Uh, there's adsorption for one minute. And then let's put it on the shelf for a few hours and go back and measure it again. It hasn't moved. Uh, oh, fine. Let's take that sample, uh, uh, heat it up to 55 degrees C, cool it back down and remeasure the spectrum and it hasn't moved. That is to say, gas phase adsorption of acetone in this system does not yield the same distribution of acetone in the structure as the liquid loading. Uh, this is uh, an interesting puzzle. Uh, it's called Schroeder's paradox that uh, uh, thermodynamics says that um, a vapor phase at saturation should result in the same uh, adsorption as the liquid does. And in this system, it doesn't for reasons which we don't completely understand yet. Uh, oops, uh, sorry. One last thing about these carbons to get back to carbon capture. So uh, look, it turns out if you look at the CO2 adsorption capacity of these materials, uh, as a function of pressure, they have a pretty pretty reasonable adsorption capacity even compared to the MOFs. It's a sharp rise and then sort of Langmuirian, but uh, the point is that they have a very high capacity for CO2. So we'll use the apparatus developed uh, in our lab in which we dose samples inside of a tube and then have an apparatus that allows us to cap a rotor and then take that sample, do simple MAS, and in high ends case, uh, we see that the CO2 sorbed in this material is in fact just gas phase CO2 uh, fizzy sorbed inside of the material, which means that its regeneration uh, should also be facile. So uh, this was uh, Dr. Haiyan Mao, a visiting scholar with my group who, who led this paper, which just appeared two weeks ago. Uh, and I already mentioned Alex being responsible uh, for these works. And if I have uh, done this correctly, I'm done. Yes, indeed. Uh, so thank you all very, very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, at 8.42, we're just on time. So I'm happy to answer questions, uh, however they're delivered to me. OK, <clears throat> Alex, thank you, uh, Jeff, rather, <clears throat> very much. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself and start my video here. Um, okay, it's the video, the video still doesn't start, okay. Should I release the screen? There, maybe, no, 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 that's not, you're not the problem. Okay. okay. That's a rare situation, usually I am the problem, so. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> let's look in the chat um, and see if there are questions for, um, for Jeff. Okay. Um, in the, well, there's nothing in the, okay. There are lots of questions though. Uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey Bodenhausen says, I volunteered to join the three Jeffs on your next paper. Okay. I'll be in touch, Jeff. Okay. And Aaron Rossini says, I, I have probably asked this to Jeff before, but how stable are the carbon mates in the moths? And do you have to study the samples in gas type to tubes, probably rotors? Uh, containing free CO2, or can you just expose materials to CO2, then pack them into a rotor and study them by the NMR before the carbamates revert to amines? Okay, thanks, Aaron, for your question. Uh, good to see you this morning. Um, 
so this it's this cycling uh, stability of, of carbamates for the diamine adsorptions that has been uh, problematic. So yes, you can do 10 cycles and it looks fine, but in an industrial process, you're gonna need 100,000 cycles. Uh, and so many, but not all of the diamines fail that test. One of the reasons we uh, moved to the tetraamines, which at least uh, after a thousand cycles uh, are still stable. So we, we feel as though this process can be reversible. Uh, and so that's, that's handy. Uh, so as I showed in the last slide, and maybe uh, I'll just, uh, maybe I, you can see it in the background here. So this is pretty much what we do. The, the rotor is in this tube uh, with a cap uh, sort of attached on a little, a little screw. And so we introduce the gases at a known dosage and then push down and seal the rotor inside of this tube uh, and then uh, take that and put it in the uh, NMR machine. So we do all the adsorption and desorption in the, in the, with the sample packed in the rotor. Uh, there are non-trivial issues you have to think about, like does the a gas access all the material and so forth and so on. And you have to do some control experiments to make sure that you're not um, uh, just accessing a small portion of the sample. But in general, uh, this is the apparatus we use. Uh, and uh, Aaron, I, th I think that answers your question. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Elia Morose uh, wants to know, is the chemical shift of the dinitrogen N15 and N15 NMR due to the paramagnetic shift or due to the Lewis acid base pair formed? Uh, the answer is almost certainly both. And we're uh, uh, you know, in the process of doing DFT calculations to examine the nature of that shift. Uh, but it almost certainly has a paramagnetic contribution, which can be teased out with variable temperature measurements. Okay, and how many scans uh, is the N15 gas NMR spectrum? How many shots were required for that uh, gas phase spectrum? Mm -hmm. That was not bad signal noise at all, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and the answer is, uh, I probably don't know, uh, but what I can say is that it's easily obtainable overnight, maybe in a few hours, depending on the field strength. And um, that reminds me, actually, whoever asked that question, there's a, 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 the answer is I don't know, but let's just say a few hours. It's certainly on the order of a few hours. But I, I think there's an important statement that I need to tell my NMR colleagues, which is that one of the reasons we can do all this blunt NMR is that we don't pay for instrument time uh, because either the instruments are our own in our lab or if we use the NMR facility, as we have for many of these measurements, uh, we have an arrangement with them that, for example, on the weekends, uh, we do solid state NMR uh, for the whole weekend at a fixed, a fixed inexpensive fee. So um, this is a message to all of you out there who are associated with NMR facilities. Uh, and that there's a, a challenge for doing solid state NMR in facilities where you're paying by the hour. And it's really advantageous for you to work with your facility managers to figure out uh, uh, another a way around that problem. And then, for example, the dauntingness of N15 NMR might be to do a whole series of studies at different pressures, for example. It certainly will take a weekend uh, on the NMR instrument or maybe two weekends. And if you're paying $20 an hour for that, it gets to be problematic. So, um, so I'm sorry I went on that aside, but I just wanted to point out that we should be working with our NMR facilities people so that solids NMR is more accessible. Okay, uh, that was an anonymous question, by the way. And so Dominic Kubecki uh, uh, wants to know how far are away are we from in situ NMR absorption studies? Uh, do you think <coughs> that they would be valuable tool uh, for mechanistic studies? Uh, uh, excellent, uh, Dominic. There, there are people who are doing this in situ now. Uh, and um, sorry, let, I should be careful. So, in situ studies of adsorption actually date date back to uh, the, the latter part of the 20th century. I mean, when catalysis and chemisorption for catalysis was an important field um, in the NMR community. Uh, there were people doing in situ adsorption and you know, Jim Hawes name come to mind. Maybe Bob will remember that name. Uh, others, including my group. Um, 
So uh, it is challenging, of course, to do mechanistic studies because NMR only detects the reservoirs of stable species. So one thing you can do is, you know, uh, do adsorption and reaction at temperature, quench the temperature or pressure, and then look and see what's left behind. Uh, those kinds of studies can go on. In terms of adsorption for separation processes, I know Ike Brunner and the group at, uh, in, in Dresden, uh, I know they have set up and are doing this. I think Gregor Mali and, uh, uh, has been doing this uh, in, in uh, Ljubljana and, and perhaps others, and I apologize if I've not mentioned your name. So the answer, Dominic, is we're not far away at all. People can do it. The question is, what are you trying to see and can NMR even detect it if it's life, is it long lived enough for NMR to detect it? Uh, okay, so Art <clears throat> Palmer has a question and since he has to leave for a faculty meeting shortly, let's cover it. He wants to know, I missed the reason why symmetric amines are preferred. Uh, wouldn't you want one functional group that is more specific for the metal and another more for the CO2? Yeah, thanks, Art, for that question. Uh, you know, it's uh, some some asymmetric amines are better than the symmetric ones. You know, when we are trying to span what the tetraamine, the exact length of the pore, uh, the symmetry seemed like a good idea because we are placing the capturing nitrogens in the middle of the molecule, in the middle of the pore, and the ends were going to either side of the um, the, the chain. For the diamines, for many of the capture processes, you're right. The asymmetric ones are better. Uh, and, and more stable. Uh, so good point, and you're right. I tried a very related question. Uh, <clears throat> Jeffrey wants to know, can you repeat uh, the reason why the tetramine is so resistant uh, to water, against water? Yeah, the presumption, uh, 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 Jeff, is that um, you have you have two ends bound uh, on the tetramine on either, uh, uh, you know, nearby to the nearby metal atoms. And that confers a stability to the whole chain that isn't present when only one end is bound and the other end is flopping into the pore. Um, okay. <clears throat> and so, uh, Helen Mayo says 200s. I'm not sure what that I suspect what she means is it takes 200 seconds to get a, to get a nitrogen gas phase spectrum. Uh, okay. I suspect that's what she means. Thank you, Haya. 200 seconds. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so Gil, Gil Gobis, he wants to know, he's related uh, to the shielding effect of the benzene rings in the pine material, which is quite large. Uh, does the treated pine contain free electrons and did you measure their EPR spectrum? Um, uh, I don't know and no is the technical question, uh, but you can uh, look at the structure of the material from the point of view of microscopy and estimate what the nuclear independent chemical shift is and it's consistent with the numbers we see. Uh, but uh, you're quite right, we should and could do EPR and maybe we'll do that. That's a good point. Yeah, no, the EPR spectrum would probably be, in, in all of these things would be uh, interest, good and interesting to look at, especially when you have things like vanadium there and um, probably some manganese left over from something. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, Renal Guillaume wants to know, would it be more robust uh, to steam to have the amine site connected to the linker rather than the metallic site? And how do you, how do the CO2 cap, how does the CO2 capture efficiency, how would that be in that case? And it says, thanks for a great talk. And it was a really good talk. So uh, yeah, thank you, Renald. Uh, that's an excellent question. So uh, a parallel uh, path of research uh, using the same kinds of strategies, carbon, nitrogen, proton, het core, uh, has been looked at by my group uh, at amines bound to the, to the linkers. And the answer is much uh, a similar kind of carbon chemistry happens, and you would think that would be better. The problem is you don't, we have yet to be able to get this cooperative mechanism. So the advantage of the reaction with, uh, via amines on the metal centers is that the isotherm has this nice steep shape. Uh, the isotherm with uh, amines bound to the linkers or attached to the linkers tends to be Langmuirian, and so the, uh, the extremes of temperature and pressure to desorb the material are much bigger, making it much less attractive from an energy consumption point of view. But there are some papers in the literature, and uh, if you look under my former student, Tom Pop, P-O-P-P, -P, uh, you'll find uh, his papers using NMR to look at uh, these, that kind of question. 
Okay, <clears throat> and so the final uh, two questions are from CB. Uh, he wants to know at very low CO2 concentration, say 0.5 to 1 CO2 per cell, would you observe an exchanging type system like the CO2 carbam carbamate hopping? Or do the cooperative iterations end up with a combination of completely filled sites and completely empty sites? Um, yeah, I'm thinking, don't go away yet. Okay. And he also wants to know, have you considered aromatic diamines uh, as proton sponges or even um, phenantrolene type pyridine based compounds or have these been tried by other labs? Uh, the second question is easier for me to answer because the answer is no, not yet. Uh, the, uh, you know, between Alex and his work with my group, the group going on, work going on now, and other work in the long group that doesn't involve NMR, I think they've looked at 150 di and tetra means of various types. And I, so I don't have them all categorized, but the answer to the second question is probably not. The first question is, is a little more tricky. Uh, in uh, Alex Force's Jack's paper, there is a, an NMR study of CO2 adsorbed in the system as a function of concentration or partial pressure at the very early part of the isotherm, sort of halfway up the isotherm, and at the end of the isotherm. And, um, uh, and I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I can answer your question without thinking, thinking about it offline, uh, CV, because I, I, there is some interesting argument and discussion as to whether or not the carbamates can be thought of as, as a polymerization reaction where you have chains and ends and that the chain length may vary and that this may be related. And I'm, I'm not quite have that all uploaded in my brain right now, but let me just put it this way. I think that's a really good question. I think it's a question of active research. I don't think I can give you a definitive answer. Okay, all right. Okay, well, <clears throat> so uh, that completes uh, all the open questions. All right. So I think we should again thank uh, Jeff for a really great seminar. Thank you very much. Great to be here today. Okay, it was, uh, it was blunt NMR, but it was actually very useful, very informative. And, and it really reminds us of just how powerful an NMR can be, even in its simplest forms. Uh, so thanks again, Jeff. And uh, we will see everybody in a couple of weeks. Um, we don't have the program quite straightened out for that time yet, uh, but we're working on it. And we will have uh, these, these visits in two weeks from now, which is uh, what, October 17th. And then another one on something like December 1st or so. Uh, so again, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, and um, we will see everybody back in two weeks and four weeks or so. Great to be here. So long all. Bye-bye.